Hello and welcome back to A Shot of Wildlife. Today I've travelled all the way into Suffolk to RSPB in Minsmere and I'm here with a purpose. I'm here hoping to see and film a bittern. It's springtime so there's loads of wildlife about, there'll be some baby animals, perhaps some young birds and I'm going to have lots of wildlife to show you. So come on, let's get going. If you've been following my channel for a while now, you might have seen my previous visits to Minsmere in the autumn. But in the late spring, it's a very different place and this video is going to be jam-packed full of wildlife. I wasn't alone at Minsmere. I had Fred from Watch Our Wildlife with me and together we tried to head straight to the aptly named Bit and Hide. But despite my confidence, I took us the wrong way and we ended up at Island Mere Hide instead. It wasn't too bad. Before we even got inside, someone pointed out a cuckoo perched at the top of some distant trees. It's interesting that as I was filming this, some of the other cuckoos that had arrived in the UK this spring had already started their return migration south. Time waits for no bird, and he was off. Nearby, a four-spotted chaser dragonfly perched on a reed, perhaps waiting for a small insect to fly by and become dinner, or maybe waiting for a potential mate. All dragonflies have four dark spots at the leading edge of their wings, but ironically, the four-spotted chaser has eight. These are called pterostigma, and it's believed that they help the animal to balance its wings during flight. It was time to venture into the hide, which was quite busy, but gave excellent views over a shallow pool and vast reed beds. The perfect habitat for a bittern. Bitterns are members of the heron family and one of their close relatives, a grey heron, was perched on a wooden beam above the water. These are much easier to see and much more common than bitterns, but then suddenly a call went out. Bitten flying in from the right. I didn't have time to turn my main camera around, but luckily Fred was more on the ball. It dropped down into the reeds, and to my eyes, it had vanished. With a mixture of frustration and excitement, we listened to other people who were stood within feet of us describe how they could see it, but among the reeds, to me, it was invisible. I waited, filming this patch of green, hoping for a glimpse, or for the bird to burst into flight and reveal itself. And then it did, but not in any spectacular fashion. Can you see it? right in the middle of the screen. Now I tried to make these videos as close to you being there with me as possible, but I won't make you watch 25 minutes or so of this well hidden bird, especially as I know what I'm going to show you later in this video. There were several other birds out across the water, the grey heron had been replaced by a black headed gull, and three great cormorants had pulled up a pew on the second beam. A great crested grebe rested in the distance, and a coot searched for food in the shallows. We were just about to move on to the next hide, when having a last look paid off. The bittern had revealed itself. Bitterns feed mainly on small fish and aquatic invertebrates, but they will also eat pretty much anything else that is alive and will fit down their throat in one go including amphibians, small birds and small rodents. In the late spring, they are likely to have chicks to feed, so this one was on a mission. But after giving up the hunt, it took to the sky for a second or two before disappearing back into the dense reeds. Well, how great was that? I was in the hide for probably an hour and a half. And at first, when people kept saying they could see the bit and I couldn't spot it with a camera, I thought it was going to be a waste of time. But eventually, my patience paid off and it came out into the open. Now there's an entire reserve to look around, so hopefully there's going to be a lot more wildlife for me to show you. I don't usually feature plants on this channel, but I couldn't walk past these bright pink flowers as I left the hide. I think these are southern marsh orchids, but I'm not so good with plants, so feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. 
As we worked our way in the correct direction of Bit and Hide, we were briefly interrupted by this male blackcap singing his heart out. We were on the right path now and we made it to Bit and Hide, but would it live up to its name? Yes, but only just as this one briefly took to the air before dipping back among the reeds. There wasn't much else going on from this hide apart from a loose flock of black-headed gulls picking off flying insects as they emerged from the vegetation. So we moved on and it was almost time for me to do some foraging of my own. I'm probably about a quarter of the way around the reserve now but all these steps and all this sitting and waiting for birds to appear has made me hungry. It's time for some lunch. I quickly whipped together this slice of wild carrot and walnut cake and a latte that was definitely not brought from the on-site calf. They didn't last long and then we were on our way again. Just around the corner from the calf is a sand bank which has become the warm month residence of a colony of sand martins. These small birds would have spent the winter south of the Sahara and returned to this site every year. They usually raise two broods in tunnels within the sandbank between May and September. Just down from the Martins, we passed a pond that was full with the life of spring. The highlight was this brief glimpse of a small grass snake as it worked its way through the water probably looking for little amphibians to eat. It didn't stay in sight for long, but above and on the water, there were plenty of dragon and damselflies. Another four-spotted chaser with its favorite perching spot and plenty of azure damselflies. Although this footage isn't very clear, what you can probably see are pairs joined up and laying their eggs. The male keeps hold of the female while she is laying the eggs so that no other males can swoop in and fertilize them. We carried on through the reserve, heading towards the next hide. This is North Hide, and although the scenery was beautiful and there were plenty of birds out on the scrapes, they were very far away. I did manage some okay footage of this black-headed gull though. Here, the adult bird is regurgitating food onto the ground for its grey, fluffy chicks to eat. There are several other hides that face this pool, so we didn't waste any time with distant views and carried on towards the next one. On the way, passing by the suspiciously located bee orchid. I scanned a nearby area and there were no other plants growing, just this one right next to the path in an otherwise featureless area. We soon came to a boardwalk which had opened since my last visit and made our way to East Hyde, which has also recently been done up. Just before we get there, I'd like to quickly say a massive thanks to everyone who is watching this video right now and a special thanks to everyone who comments on or likes my content. I would really love to make these wildlife videos my full-time thing, and by interacting with them, you are helping to make that dream come true. Thank you. Well, I've got to say that East Hyde is definitely the best of the hides so far today. There's so many different birds out here, avocets on their nests, two different species of terns, and loads of other waterfowl. Come on, let's take a closer look at them. I'd already been spoilt by Minsmoor, but this hide was another level. The thing I was most excited by was the many avocet nests that dotted the sandy scrapes. Despite my years of wildlife watching, I haven't ever seen this before, and a hundred years ago, I wouldn't have been able to either. Until the Second World War, they had been absent from the UK for more than a century and recolonized by taking advantage of the deliberate coastal flooding Britain carried out to slow any potential invasion. As I mentioned in that bit to camera, there are two different species of tern in front of the hide 
and these are one of them, Little Turns. Since 1985, their numbers have been steadily declining, but thanks to recent interventions and targeted conservation, it looks like their decline might be levelling out. The other species of tern in front of the hide was a colony of nesting common terns. These were quite a long way off, but something was always happening. They feed almost entirely on fish, and at Minsmere they are perfectly placed, with both the rich food source of the North Sea and the reserves lagoons and pools just on their doorstep. It wasn't just terns and avocets in front of the hide, this pair of shell ducks were out there enjoying the spring sunshine. They usually nest down old rabbit burrows and one day I would love to film a family of dead ducklings emerging for the first time. Black headed gulls were here too, much earlier in the nesting process than those at the earlier hide. 140,000 pairs nest in the UK so it's no surprise that they were probably the most numerous nesting bird of the day, that we saw at least. I could have sat in East Hyde all day, but we were there for bitterns, so decided to move on. The next part of our route took us along the reserve's eastern boundary, where last time I was lucky enough to see and film a Dartford warbler, so we kept our eyes peeled. Every small bird had the potential to be one, but all we saw was stone chat, this one with its black head is a male, and this one with much duller markings is a female, and here is a juvenile. They get their name from their call, which sounds like two stones being hit together, but they weren't calling whilst we were watching. Below the stone chats, we noticed the rabbit, but only briefly. Apparently, it had to go and dig burrows for shell ducks to move into. The next hide we came to was South Hyde, which happened to be downwind of the lagoons, and to be honest, it stank. I guess having thousands of fish eating birds upwind was always going to have its downsides. Most of the birds here were resting, but a few were feeding, including this avocet, swishing its curved bill from side to side in search of prey in the water and sediment. It was joined by a shell duck who was trying to find some food for itself. See how it also swishes its bill from side to side trying to filter out any morsels. We moved on to the next hide which wasn't very far and looked out to a different pool. Here most of the black headed gulls were having a wash. Feathers only work properly if they are clean and as they feed in messy places it's especially important for them. In the distance, some were nesting here too, and one pair were clearly preparing to do so. The avocets here had been busy as well. There were several juveniles of varying ages wandering around the shallows. Avocets will only nest once per year if their eggs hatch, so these chicks are very valuable. Their parents are always nearby and alert for any potential danger. A female mallard and her young chicks came into sight for a few seconds, but this is not always a safe place for small animals. In the distance, something had unsettled the black-headed gulls. They all took to the skies and seemed to be swooping at something I couldn't see. As there is a predator fence around the pools, I suspect they were probably swooping at a rat or perhaps even a grass snake. After a short while, they settled back down with their chicks and we decided to push on, back towards Bitten Hyde. We were both excited for the evening rush, which seems to happen with wildlife, an hour or two before dark, but neither of us could have expected to be as lucky as we were about to be. Before we could properly sit down, Fred saw and filmed this. Thank you. 
just returned to Bit and Hyde and it has lived up to its name. A bit and flew in from the distance, landed in the reeds, and then after a little while, I saw it sticking its head out. It's gone back into hiding now, but I'm gonna sit here and wait, and hopefully it'll come out into the open. And I didn't have to wait very long. Yes, after 10 minutes, it's came out of the reeds. It's on the screen right now. Bittens have fantastic camouflage, and this one would probably have been invisible if it wasn't for how green the reeds were. Like a lot of other members of the Heron family, Bittens are ambush hunters and rely on moving very slowly or remaining completely still until prey comes within reach before quickly striking and then swallowing whatever they manage to catch whole. Not only are Bittens experts of camouflage, they're also very rare. They went extinct from the UK in the 19th century, and although they did return in 1900, they were only confirmed as breeding once more in 1911. Because of how hard bitterns are to see, and thus count, their populations are monitored by the numbers of calling males. In recent counts, this number was around 200. After coming out for a wade through the pool, the bittern gradually disappeared into the reeds once more, when another of Minsmere's famous residents made an appearance, two red deer. These are both females, and are probably mother and well-grown daughter. Although they are well known for their rutting behaviour, when they gather in large herds for males to fight one another for the right to mate, throughout most of the year, Red deer roam in smaller, same-sex groups. These are the UK's largest land mammal, and adult males can grow to weigh more than 200 kilos. That's two of me on a slim day. They have brilliant eyesight, and could definitely see me and Fred watching them from the hide, and gradually made their way off into the distance. So we did the same. All right then, well, I've been super, super lucky already and why not push it a little bit further? There's probably about an hour left until I have to leave. So I'm gonna go back to the first hide I visited this morning and hopefully see some bearded tits. We didn't make it very far before we saw this non-native gray squirrel having a snack on a nest box roof. It looked like it was trying some international food, a piece of banana, and there was something else exotic nearby too, a young muntjac. At first, I thought it had seen us and was going to run away, but after a few seconds, it started to run towards us. Before seeing us for real, crossing the path and disappearing into some brambles. But it wasn't alone. Nearby there was at least three adults, including this male. They're sometimes called barking deer, and here is why. Both males and females make a bark-like call to let each other know that they are about. From here, it was a beautiful walk as the sun began to set on Minsmere and on our wildlife day. We had just a little bit of time to stop in the island near Hyde, where the view had stayed the same, but most of the birds had gone to roost. Except for a bittern. Right here, it's in the middle of the screen, and either my eyes aren't great at separating it from the green, or its camouflage is on overdrive. I did film it for 10 or 15 minutes, but the footage all looks the same to me. Just as we were about to call it a day, a small brown bird popped up on top of some nearby reeds. A male bearded tit. Brilliant. And that is where today's video comes to an end. What a beautiful view to end it all. If you enjoyed this video, then you'll probably also like this one here on the screen now. 
Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.